Welcome everyone to our second lecture. Today we'll be talking about the Parthians. So after the death of Alexander, last lecture we talked about how Seleucus, or Seleucus I established the Seleucid dynasty and controlled most of Mesopotamia, or at least the area of the Fertile Crescent. So we still have that fusion of Hellenistic art and culture with ancient Near Eastern art and culture. And these traditions, both Greek, Macedonian, are permeating the Near Eastern world. So this only continues to happen. So around 246 BCE, the Seleucids lost substantial territory in the east as a nomadic group called the Parni settled in the satrapy or the administrative district of Pathia in northern Iran. This sparks the beginning of the Parthian dynasty. So about 250 BCE, they launched an invasion under their leader, Arsaces. So Arsaces makes their imperial aspirations clear by instituting, instituting a dynastic era in 247 BCE. Subsequent rulers would assume the name Arsaces as a royal title. This is very similar to how Rome, uh, Roman emperors would assume the name Caesar. So under Mithridates I and his successors, the Parthians grew into a dominant power in the Near East. The Romans, who were ambitious to dominate the Near East in the style of Alexander, actually underestimated the capabilities of the Parthian kings and actually had to renegotiate peace under Augustus Caesar. So here, they established a primary residence at Ctesiphon, or the city of Ctesiphon, on the Tigris, Tigris River in southern Mesopotamia. Parthian kings ruled for nearly half a millennium and influenced politics from Asia Minor to northern India until they were overthrown by Sasanian armies from southwest Iran in the early 3rd century CE. So we'll be talking about the Sasanians and their inheritance takeover of the Parthians, as well as their artwork and how that evolves into this hybrid tradition. So the city of Ctesiphon, you can see the kind of expanse of the Parthian Empire is encompassing much of ancient Mesopotamia, uh, stretching to India. For more than 800 years, the city of Ctesiphon actually flourished as a royal capital of the last two ancient Near East dynasties, the Parthians and the Sasanians, until Muslim armies conquered the city in 637 CE. It's located about 20 miles from modern-day Baghdad in Iraq, and Ctesiphon's strategic lo location as well as its political importance made the city an international trading market center with a diverse population. As a result, Parthian wealth obtained through lucrative trade networks resulted in the substantial patronage of the arts, in particular relief sculpture, statuary, both large and small scale, architectural sculpture, metalwork, jewelry, and ceramics. Later on, coins with images of Parthian rulers form another important category, category of objects. So this hybrid art, you have art from Parth the Parthian cap capitals, Hectama Pylos, as well as Ectabana, and Ctesiphon. Now, the artwork from here is almost entirely lost, unfortunately. Um, most of the extant objects and monuments are from sites at the edges of the Parthian world in Syria, Mesopotamia, and the Iranian plateau. So overall, Parthian art resists a straightforward definition. We can see the merging of styles from Hellenistic, Macedon, Near Eastern, as well as Far Eastern. This particular stone relief is a product of resurgence of an Eastern or a Near Eastern aesthetic in Parthian art. The style is exemplified, or the style it exemplifies is characterized by a frontal pose with stylized linear details of the hair and beard, which we have seen many, many times. This figure as well is identified as a worshiper as his right hand is raised in a gesture of reverence. 
This figure most likely adorned the terraces of sanctuary complexes. I want you guys to think back to the standing male worshippers of Telesmar that we learned about. This particular plaque features a reclining figure on a couch covered with a herringbone and stripe pattern. We know that this is a man, which is indicated by his clothing. We can see that his torso is angled, representing him in the twisted perspective or the composite view. Another Mesopotamian at attribute is that he has disc-shaped earrings and he is holding a cup, likely dining. Uh, many ancient peoples dined in reclined positions, including the Etruscans, the Romans, uh, the Parthians. The use of this pose indicates the ties to Greek terracotta manufacturing centers that were located along the eastern Mediterranean coast. So some of the products coming out of this would be depicting reclining male and female figures, as seen on the right. The top image is of a female reclining figure. We see this is actually coming from what is known as the Archaic Period in Greece when uh, shortly after exchange between Greece and Egypt you have this kind of style that still has this sort of rigidity to the body until we get a little bit later in the Greek art period with figures like the male reclining uh, individual on on the bottom. This is a figure of a reclining woman. We can see that the attention to detail and the realism of the body as seen as in Greek art is visible in this statue from Sestaphon. Both of these were found in the city of Sestaphon. The image that is headless appears a little bit more with the Greek influence and the other one, although weathered, has more of the appearance of, say, that Ishtar figure, so relating back to those Hellenistic tendencies, as well as Assyrian and even earlier representations from ancient Mesopotamia. So it really depends on the artist as well. These are artists that are Greek Macedonian artists that had kind of evolved into Parthians after the Seleucids and are completing both both styles simultaneously. Take a look at what as well at the subtle incised lines of the toes and the hands. There's the creases of the neck and stomach. Interestingly, while in Greek culture, nudes would typically be of men or as the figures of Aphrodite as it was immodest to represent a Greek woman in the nude. However, in Mesopotamia, the opposite is true. Whether the figurine is made from terracotta or alabaster in this case, the subject was usually a woman. The folds of the body are more idealized as seen in the Greek Hellenistic traditions, but the incised lines also come from local traditions of car carving female figures. The eyes as well would have been inlaid with precious materials such as the rubies that we saw or even lap lapis lazuli. And the function of these figurines has been described by scholars as being goddesses, dolls, and fertility amulets. Parthian architectural sculpture also reveals the merging of Greek and Mesopotamian motifs. This lintel, as we can see, this is the lintel portion, so the horizontal portion of the post and lintel construction, once decorated the doorway in the north hall of the main palace at Hatra. So, if we remember from our last lecture, Hatra was located in northern Iraq and was a major trading city for the Parthians. It was heavily fortified against Roman attack and populated by a mixture of peoples including Parthians, Arabs, and the mixed peoples of Syria. This particular lintel features hybrid creatures with the bodies and head of a lion with elongated ears, wings of an eagle, kind of typical of representations of griffins in the ancient Near East, as we have seen many, many times. Think back to the Lamassus, or these kind of hybrid creatures that represent that sense of power. 
The Roman influence as well can be seen in the shape and form of the large vase that depicts a lotus leaf. Also possible Egypt or <laughs> possible influence from Egypt since Rome by this time was in control of Egypt. The luxury arts were produced for Parthian patrons and included finely crafted metal vessels and even jewelry. So this is also giving us an indication of the wealth of the population who could afford to commission custom pieces with these kind of precious materials. These vessels were often made of gold, silver, bronze, or clay and were used in a vast area extending both to the west and east of Iran. The kind of motifs that were very popular were floral and decorative. This bowl in particular is decorated with a concentric pattern and a central multi-petaled rosette within a wreath. So think back to the symbolism of the rosette as well, relating back to the goddess Ishtar. And we see this being encircled by a floral scroll with wave patterned bands. Many objects like this actually feature imagery associated with the Greek god of wine, Dionysus. Dionysus was the god of fertility and wine in the Greek culture, uh, later considered the patron of the arts. He was also the initiator of viticulture, or the science, production, and study of grapes. So he is known to have introduced wine to man. He also had a dual nature, so on the one hand he brought joy and divine ecstasy, or he would bring brutal and blinding rage, thus reflecting the dual nature of one's personality on wine or under the influence. The cult of Dionysus was popular in Greek culture and gained even more followers as Alexander moved eastward. We see many vessels and jewelry featuring this imagery associated with this Greco-Roman deity. So this we saw in our lecture on animals in ancient Near Eastern art. This is actually a Parthian example, which is perfect for conveying this type of uh, Greek religious imagery in Mesopotamian art. So again, these types of animals were used for ritens. So common animals uh, include rams, horses, bulls, ibexes, even supernatural creatures or female deities. So these are popular motifs from ancient Mesopotamia. Some would have been graved with royal inscriptions or were adorned with geometric and organic metallic designs, as we can see at the top of this, uh, this writing. In this case, we have an ivy wreath on the rim and there's a fruit-filled grapevine that we see wrapping around the panther. These earrings as well are the ones to the left. You can see our grape clusters and the earring to the or excuse me to the right is actually a trilobed wine skin that came from Nineveh. So the use of this jewelry is also confirmed by its presence in funerary portraits found in Palmyra and Hatra. Pomegranates were also a popular subject in jewelry as they were associated with fertility. You can see on the right image there are the pomegranates. You can see the kind of tops of them uh, hanging down at the bottom. And there is also the continued use again of the inlay of these precious materials. In the earring to the left, you can see with these kind of bells, there is carnelian as well as shell being used for this earring. These types of vessels belong to a rare class of glazed ceramic ritens with female heads and animal shaped spouts. The upper portion is in the form of a vase with two handles, as we can see with this other example on the right. It appears as a tall bulbous crown above the head, which displays her puffy cheeks, thickly lined eyes and brows, and small lips. This richly patterned hairstyle is embellished by a diet, diadem similar to the one that we saw at the Assyrian palace, but it's, this one is made of wheat stalks with a band that includes a palmette, a crescent and star, and a rosette. The neck then tapers into the neck of an animal, typically a bull. 
This possibly identifies the female figure as the goddess Nana. We talked about the daughter, or excuse me, she's actually the daughter of the moon god. We talked about the moon god being represented as Nana, or also Sin, later on. And uh, Nana is the sister as well of the sun god. This nature and astral deity, although first seen in Mesopotamian texts, is referred to texts from the Esagila and Temple of Marduk in Babylon as being the, quote, the power over princes and the scepter of kings. So we even see this imagery that extends back even further into ancient Mesopotamia. We already saw the power of coins with Darius I and Alexander the Great, after the accession of Mithridates I, coins began to be minted for Parthian rulers. Mints were located in over 20 cities, so we can already see that the production here of coinage, particularly with a ruler's portrait, has become a very popular practice. Most coins, as seen here, feature a Parthian king's portrait on the obverse facing left, and either a seated archer or a standing figure and fire altar on the reverse, typically surrounded by an inscription. Silver was the main metal used, and the drachm was the primary denomination, and most were minted in the city of Ekbatana, whereas tetradams were produced almost exclusively in Sesiphon. So drachms and tetradrachms are just different types of money or different uh, numerical values. This drachm features the bust of the Parthian king Mithridates II, who ruled from 124 to 88 BCE. This is a typical representation of a Parthian ruler with his long beard, so again, still that emphasis on the beard, and his short hair that curls at the end, which is actually a Greek influence. So the back features an archer seated on a high-backed throne and is holding a bow. The script is translated as, quote, Arsaces, great king, god manifest. This was to honor the founder of the Parthians, Arsaces, from the 3rd century BCE. We also still see that the imagery of a bowman is still very prominent. So on these types of coins, you not only have powerful political logos, but also the political portrait. So it is the kind of first combination of these two. For our next lecture, review, or we will be discussing the Sasanian culture and their artistic productions. Make sure that you turn in your museum essay April 20th, so make sure uh, to adhere to the reminders. Um, keep up with your notes as well as you guys will be receiving one discussion question on each Friday, so one on the 20th, one on the 27th, and that will be do do in hard copy as well at the beginning of class on Monday, April 30th, when we return to the classroom. Until next time.